We, ex uh, we expect litigation up to uh, the time the confetti falls and the balloons are, are let loose. Uh, there's uh, litigation in, in, we at the Brennan Center are engaged in cases all across the country. A lot of other civil rights and voting rights groups are as well. And uh, there will be quite a bit of litigation and uh, on election day, everything from uh, challenges to judges keeping polling places open and things like that. Yes. Yes. It's not only when they vote at the polls. It's the it's the it's the first time they vote, whether it's by absentee or by or at the polls. So they would have to they would have to include a copy of their ID um, when the first time they vote. Yes, ma'am. Luckily, we have uh, tremendously committed coalition partners. The Election Protection Coalition, it's not just the Brennan Center and the Lawyers Committee and Common Cause and everybody else in this room, but uh, it's, it's, over, uh, it's over 150 different organizations at the state, local, and national level. Uh, so all of us are promoting the number through our relationships with our constituents. But there's also an aggressive communications plan. So we have partnerships with, uh, uh, with media outlets who are committed to, to publicizing the number. Uh, there'll be a, a paid media campaign also focusing mostly on, on radio uh, to be able to get the number out. We're trying to get it out to as many voters as we possibly can. Yes. it either upon registration or upon voting. So that means at some point in the process, um, a first-time voter who's registering by mail has to show. To a um, government I, official. Yeah, to a government official. So if, if it was in a, a private group doing registration, that doesn't count. The, right. Then the person would have to show it at the polls. Okay. Yes, ma'am. We couldn't decide whether to include provisional ballots as a problem or as a failed solution. But you know, it's it's. Uh, we don't want provisional ballots to be placebo voting, where voters think they've cast a ballot, and uh, then that's just to make them feel good, and they walk away. But actually, their ballot is not counted. And in terms of the standards, what 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 are you? Uh, we certainly hope that there'd be more uniform standards for counting provisional ballots, certainly across state lines, if not nationally. And you know, as it turns out, um, if you're in one county, your ballot could count, and if you're in another county, it might not count. And there's um, not not only not uniform standards, but often um, ad hoc standards for counting provisional ballots. So this really, you know, needs to be made a much more robust fail-safe. It's supposed to save the votes of eligible voters who, for some technical reason, weren't on the rolls or otherwise. Uh, where um, election officials couldn't determine their eligibility, we should be able to determine that and count a much higher percentage of that. We, we have the ability to do that. And this goes again to what we hope will be a focus uh, after the election, where given the range of problems and given the possibility technically now with computer lists that didn't exist before to really move to a much better, more modern system, that would be one of the kinds of things that could be uh, appropriately standardized across the national level. And I think the Count of Revote Act uh, which was introduced by Senator Hillary Clinton and the late Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs Jones did that in the last session of Congress. Yes, we'll have time for everybody. The deadline was under the National Voter Registration Act and it was 90 days before a federal election. Uh, there is evidence th that but purge these purges are happening without accountability. So we don't know with the purges as much as we know about a lot of these other areas. There was a recent press report in the New York Times by Ian Urbina suggesting uh, that the purges are still going on in a number of places um, and in, in large numbers, or that there are at least steps being taken toward purges. 
And in terms of national deadline and national uh, standards, there really are not, uh, other than in bits and pieces and other pieces of legislation. We, we can. I encourage you to take a look at the the report, uh, voter purges, um, that we released, uh, moving away um, or to people dying, uh, and uh, you know the problem. You don't want people who are who are dying. You don't want people who are, you don't want the dead voting, but the problem is a lot of times uh, it turns out to paraphrase Monty Python that they're not dead yet. Uh, that that uh, death records are imprecise, social security records are imprecise, um, and uh, the way that a lot of areas will find out if somebody's moved is they'll send them mail, and if the mail is returned, then they say, oh, they must have moved, but actually the post office is very uh, inadequate, and so uh, there are all kinds of problems with these, these purge lists. Every single purge list that the Brennan Center has ever looked at has had significant errors, and there's no reason to think that that isn't a widespread problem. Yes. Sure. I think what he said was, um, you know, voter fraud. So, like, voting by ineligible voters. I don't know that anybody's um, quantified, um, you know, improper voter registration applications. Those don't turn into improper voting by ineligible people, and so that's what's been quantified. We actually have a report which might yes. be available here called um, "The Truth About Voter Fraud." Um, I think there are copies out there where we actually investigated all of the allegations of um, ineligible people voting of um, voter fraud over. Um, the past uh, decade or so, and actually found um, a, only a handful of proven cases of in-person voter fraud over hundreds of millions of votes. And, there, and this was a priority investigation by the Department of Justice over uh, five years on their ballot integrity initiative, um, and, they, um, and they were not able to find um, any um, proven incidents of um, in-person voter fraud. Whereas the vote suppression measures, we've been able to quantify their impact um, significantly. So, I mean, the numbers affected, I mean, are, are readily available. People who were, you can see how many provisional ballots were not cast, counted. You can see how many people don't match. You can sometimes, when, when after, the, after it's too late, um, find out how many people have been purged and how many have been eligible. So those numbers have been, you know, are in the hundreds of thousands. So. And it's millions, and actually. It, it is only a little bit of organizational uh, self-congratulation to note that this study on voter fraud that we did, the truth about voter fraud, was cited by both the majority as well as the minority in the Supreme Court case that upheld voter ID. They just didn't think that it, it they, they found it, <laughs> they, they felt that it showed that there was not a substantial problem of voter fraud. Uh, what we found in there was that you are more, a voter is more likely to be killed by lightning than to commit voter fraud, statistically. And other, again, voter fraud being showing up to vote at the polling place when you're not who you say you are. 